Andrea Stander and Dave Rogers from Earl Vermont and Nofa Vermont in leading the Vermont Right to Know GMOs team. So we've been working to try and get GMOs labeled in Vermont for the last two years and uh, we're really excited for the opportunity we have this year in the, oh man, yeah, that works better. Um, <laughs> we're very excited for the opportunity we have uh, this coming January for Vermont to be the, the first state we actually see labels on GMO foods. So um, that makes me really excited to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Gary Hirschberg. Gary Hirschberg has overseen Stonyfield's farms operations for the past 35, 30 years when they grew from a seven cow farm school to a uh, international yogurt producer with over $300 million in sales annually. So, pretty impressive. Uh, New Hampshire native Gary is uh, one of the first graduates of Hampshire College along with our very own Andrea Stander, so some, some good Hampshire representation in the room. Uh, Gary joined Stonyfield in 1983 as the director of their World Education Center and from the small organic farming school from which Stonyfield started. They realized they needed to get some revenue to help support the school, so they put their seven cows to work making delicious, toxic, uh, free, and chem uh, yogurt that's free of persistent uh, pesticides or chemical fertilizer. And needless to say, the yogurt business took off and has been growing steadily ever since. In 2012, Gary stepped down as the CEO of Stonyfield Yogurt to focus on his advocacy work for a sustainable food system. While he still oversees some of the operations at Stonyfield, he has become a national leader in the fight to label genetically engineered foods. As the chairman of the Just Label It campaign, Gary led efforts which uh, got an unprecedented 1.3 million comments into the FDA asking them to put labels on genetically engineered food, which is, well, unprecedented. <laughs> um, uh, he's lent his voice to our efforts here in Vermont, having testified in front of our House Agriculture Committee. I know he's been working very hard over in New Hampshire where they're trying to get these foods labeled, and, and down in Washington, D.C., uh, he's one of the leaders of this movement. Uh, Gary has received six honorary degree doctorates and won numerous awards for corporate and environmental leadership. He serves on several corporate and nonprofit boards, including Honest Tea, uh, Samazon, Peak Organic Brewing Company, The Danning Company, and Climate Counts. And uh, we're very honored to have Gary with us here today. And without further ado, will you give him uh, a large round of applause? Thanks, Falco. Good morning, everybody. I, um, it's really appropriate to be uh, speaking at a meeting that's co-hosted by these two uh, wonderful sponsors. Because in my mind, uh, the GMO issue really is a toxics issue, and I'll explain that very shortly. In fact, it was interesting for me driving over this morning, I realized we were about 750 yards from one of our first uh, organic dairy farms, the Bidley Farm, just down the hill here. Um, and this is really what led me, it was my concern about the farmers, and you just heard an example right here, that led me to step down from Stonyfield to lead this labeling effort. Uh, because, as you may know, about four years ago we witnessed this sort of lightning fast approval of genetically engineered alfalfa in this country. This was solving a problem that really didn't exist. This is an herbicide tolerant alfalfa. We had no, um, the, 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 the seven 7% of alfalfa growers in this country were using herbicides. There was no, nobody calling for herbicide tolerant alfalfa, but the chemical companies, the patent holders who developed this wonderful technology saw in their infinite wisdom uh, that it was, um, uh, you know, a, a, another profit opportunity. And, I, and in the organic business, particularly in the Northeast, where we do have to depend to some extent on grain and feed, uh, alfalfa is a really critical element. It's a critical element for all 1,400 of the dairy farmers who now support Stonyfield. And so the threat of seed pollution, the threat of losing uh, traditional varieties, the threat of farmers, to farmers who really did not want to be uh, connected to or part of this uh, movement uh, to more and more GMOs, uh, really uh, led me to realize, just as you have realized, that we need a political voice behind this movement, that to operate in a kind of, um, you know, very decentralized, a loosely connected way is not going to win the war against such well-funded opponents. 
And so I want to just take a moment to underscore uh, what Just Label It stands for um, and understand that we are 680 organizations. I stand here representing a coalition, and I assure you, like all coalitions, uh, there's not much that we agree on, but we agree on the right to know. This is a, a we, we run the entire political spectrum. We have folks uh, who are uh, promoting labeling because they don't like Monsanto. We have folks promoting labeling because they don't like herbicides. We have conventional dairy farmers, uh, or rather conventional uh, crop farmers who don't like uh, the fact that uh, we've got um, uh, herbicide tolerant weeds now out of control in this country. We've got folks who have religious concerns who refer to GMOs as God moving over and just don't like messing with God's work. And we have everybody in between. And so this coalition, which as you just heard, has been working with Center for Food Safety and others responsible for the largest number of comments into the FDA and the history of the FDA has been active, not just at the federal level, but also on many, many state levels. There are 26 different states right now uh, debating this. We saw Washington State go down uh, this week. Uh, I still consider a victory. Uh, in terms of, uh, uh, for reasons that I'll explain shortly, uh, in New Hampshire, as was just explained, we're battling, we're battling everywhere. But Vermont is going to be a really critical battleground, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to join you today. It's important to understand the roots of this whole issue for a moment. Under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, the FDA is required by statute, by law, to make known to consumers changes in our food or changes in the process of growing our food that are not otherwise apparent to us. And so you've seen a wide, wide range of mandatory labels that have come about for the simple uh, reason that, that these are material changes that have happened in our food system. And what's striking, of course, is that this has been a, a very, very sweeping and rapid change with GMOs. 90% of the soy in this country is now genetically modified. It was only introduced in 1996. Uh, 80 plus percent of feed corn is genetically modified. Um, to understand the roots of why we're not labeling, despite the fact that a very sweeping change has happened, uh, you have to go back to 1992. And then Vice President Quayle, some of you may remember, didn't spell that well, um, <laughs> managed something called the Council on Competitiveness, the President's Council on Competitiveness, where in, in a very brilliant move, and this is a, a lot like the Cheney Energy uh, committees. This was a non-citizen participatory process. This was not even a congressional process. This was a task force appointed by the then uh, Bush White House. Uh, they uh, made a uh, set of, 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 of guideline recommendations that were adopted by the FDA and remain in place today. That it is only material to the consumer. Remember, the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act says that they need to label changes that are material to the consumer. So they went at the definition of materiality and said it's only material if it's organoleptic. Can you taste it or see it or smell it? Or is it nutritious, a nutritional change? So understand that this was brilliant because of course you can't taste, smell, or see the difference between genetically engineered soy or not. And certainly uh, one can't make a nutritional case. So in effect, because these, these, uh, this narrowing of the, de of the aperture, this narrowing of the definition of what's material, this now uh, led the FDA to being able to say, great, we don't have to label uh, these, uh, these changes. Now, understand, this is there's just a fundamental hypocrisy in our federal policy here. On the one hand, the FDA is now saying these are materially the same. They are, they are fundamentally e equivalent, whether they're genetically engineered or not. And yet, over at the Commerce Department, just down the road, in DC, hundreds of patents have been given out, which of course, to get a patent, you have to be able to prove that it's fundamentally different, distinctive. Uh, uh, and, and of course, hundreds of these patents have gone out and they've been well defended. The other hypocrisy is that since 1992, there have been dozens of changes in our food system, fundamental new modern changes that have been mandatorily labeled, um, country of origin, wild versus farm, orange juice from concentrate, and the best example of all, irradiated foods. And again, you can't see, smell, or taste the difference between irradiated foods and not. And, and you can't make a claim that they're nutritionally different. You can't even make a claim that there's safety, that there's safety concerns here. In fact, the technology advocates, the patent holders of irradiation technology, 
wanted it labeled because they're proud of the technology. They believe it will help with food safety. And it's just striking then uh, to understand what has happened in the rest of the world and here where we have uh, patent holders who clearly are not proud of their technology. Elsewise, um, you know, I think you would, you would have a different picture. So, so understand that we have a base requirement at the FDA that we're just trying to get the FDA to be responsible to um, live up to their own standards that they've now lived up to on so many other occasions. At, that, at the same time, the question you may say is, well then what are we doing here in Vermont? Well, unfortunately, I don't probably need to explain to this audience that things don't work terribly smoothly in Washington these days. That uh, unfortunately it is going to take the states, it's pretty clear, to drive uh, this effort. And part of it is legislative. In other words, we need to have our state leaders be uh, speaking to our congressional and senatorial representatives. We at Just Label actually don't believe we do, we need legislation, but it certainly would help. Part of it is regulatory. We need to speak to the regulators. We need to speak to the White House and Kathleen Sebelius, who ultimately over HHS, who oversees F, uh, uh, FDA. And, and part of it is we need to speak to the companies who've been so actively involved. And this is probably one of the most significant places where we can leverage our personal power. In Washington, in California, you saw Prop 37, about a 54 million to five million dollar spending spree. 54 million for the no side, five million for the yes side. We only lost by 1.8 percentage points. And it's important to understand that there were a great many GMA, Grocery Manufacturers Association companies who funded that no effort. But then when it came to 522 this week, uh, in Washington, um, where again we were outspent three to one. Those many of those companies who funded the no effort in California did not join uh, in Washington, and the reason for that, and we're in conversations with them all, especially now, because is that, that these companies have started to realize that the cost of fighting may be lo a lower cost than the cost of the label itself. In other words, that there's a financial cost in fighting state by state by state, but there's also a reputational cost. If you go to the Just Label It website this morning, you will see that the companies who funded No on Prop 37, who did not fund No on 522, are companies who need, are, need to be identified and need to be um, uh, 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 applauded for not uh, continuing in this fight. And more and more and more companies in this very uh, last couple of days, last 72 hours, have now peeled away uh, because they see that, uh, again, they came darn close to losing at 522, there's still 23 other states to go. And so a win in Vermont, as an example, we've already won in Maine and Connecticut, contingent on other states. A win in Vermont basically is sending a message not just to the feds, not just to our legislators, but to these food companies as well. And ultimately, and I can tell you from 30 years in business, you know, it's the, it's the consumer who pays our bills. We all work for the person who's running our items past the scanner. So let's go to the first slide here, and I just want you to understand all the while that we've been having this discussion, um, this is what's been going on around the world. Uh, 64 other nations have labeled ge uh, genetically engineered foods in the time that we've been debating it here in this country. What that means is that over 60% of the world's population lives in countries where they have the right to know what's going on. And it's important to remember, if you could just click to the next slide, please, um, what this brouhaha is all about. Well, let's go one more. <coughs> Uh, this is just one label that we picked up in, in, in uh, the UK. But, uh, you know, we're not talking about skull and crossbones here. We're not talking about... Granted, Washington State was the ballot initiative, and I think, frankly, one of the reasons it lost is it was demanding uh, that something be placed on the principal display panel on the front. At Just Label, we actually don't believe that's necessary. We would be very satisfied to see the four or five words in the ingredient label. Uh, contains or does or, or might contain a genetically engineered whatever it is. So understand that while there's all kinds of sensationalism out there, we're really talking about four or five words. And again, this is very consistent with the tradition of FDA policy. Um, um, the other thing that's very interesting before I go on is that some of you may have seen this ad. When uh, GE crops were approved in, in the EU and in the UK, uh, they were approved contingent on the fact that they had to be labeled. And it was fascinating that Monsanto, the very company who's probably put more into the no efforts 
in the U.S. than any other, uh, came out with this ad. And I would draw your attention particularly to the fifth paragraph down. Monsanto fully supports UK food manufacturers and retailers in their introduction of these labels. We believe you should be aware of all the facts before making a purchase. Now, that's, that's if you're British, apparently, not if you're uh, American. Um, it, it, it is striking to me to understand uh, this, that this is a company that is uh, absolutely uh, uh, pulled out every last stop, and so too the bio organization, the, the six uh, uh, GMO patent holders, um, have spent tens of millions of dollars. Uh, the lobbying efforts uh, are, if you spend any time on Capitol Hill, you know, Lily Tomlin has this great line, she says, no matter how cynical I get, it's hard to keep up. And if you spend any amount of time on Capitol Hill, you, 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 you can see what I'm talking about. There is not a single uh, legislative uh, hearing on, on any issue related to food, even immigration reform, that the bio folks are not present in the room. It's just dramatic. Monsanto themselves have spent uh, $68 million in lobbying alone in the last decade uh, down there. And that's not including what's been spent on campaign donations, which of course have been screen through all kinds of other um, uh, uh, other funds, so it's very difficult to, it's harder to track. Um, and it's really easy, if you go to the next one please, to see um, uh, what's going on here. Uh, this is a, uh, an article that came out in uh, the summer in Food Safety News, and uh, you can Google it and look this up, but essentially the gist of this is that Monsanto is very actively and very profitably pursuing a non-GMO strategy in Europe. The, the existence of labeling uh, has really changed their strategy completely. And, but what you see here is there's plenty of money being made, there's plenty of, um, of, uh, of, of profits to be had there. These are, at the same time, this gives us a lens into what's going on here in the US because obviously these seeds are extremely profitable. And as I will explain in a moment, the chemicals associated with these seeds are even more profitable, and that's really where the dollars are. So you have to clearly follow the money here. This is why when in Vermont, the last time around, uh, you all were threatened and your legislators were uh, felt threatened that um, lawsuits would uh, ar arise out of passage of the bill. This is why these folks can throw this kind of money around, because this is so such incredibly profitable stuff. Let's go ahead to the next one, please. So um, this is really what's going on. Um, if you look at the big picture, uh, more than 50% of the world's GMOs are, are produced and sold right here. Uh, it is interesting to note on this slide that uh, the second largest uh, user, Brazil, just signed a contract with Germany to supply non-GMO soy. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see the opportunism, the opportunities opening up for other countries as America has become dominated. This is soy business that we used to be engaged in ourselves. You can bet the alfalfa, this is one of the reasons the alfalfa growers are with us at Just Label It. 50% of the nation's alfalfa exports go to Japan. Japan will not accept genetically engineered alfalfa. I'm sure you saw the wheat, the news about wheat in, from Oregon uh, this summer when um, a, a, a patch of a genetically engineered uh, wheat, which wasn't even supposed to be in the market, was discovered and uh, again uh, causing just an earthquake through the um, in trade circles, and in fact, this is a very dominant issue in the in the fair trade uh, 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 negotiations going on in both uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership in um, Asia and uh, in the European Free Trade Agreement as well. Um, so, next slide, please. Um, when when you when you strip apart this argument and you start to understand what's going on here, and again, I, I hope I've made clear this is this is really a profit play. Okay, this is. This is the concern here. This is not about feeding the world. Let's remember that labeling GMOs is not about stopping GMOs. Labeling is about our right to choose. It's about giving the marketplace a chance to determine what kinds of food production we want. And as you just saw in the prior two slides, uh, in Europe, you know, consumers have spoken, and by the way, the suppliers have responded uh, with plenty of business opportunity. Um, it's it's absolutely uh, essential that you understand, however, that going all the way back to the mid-90s, when the Quail Commission was formed and, 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 and the lead-up to the approval of these crops, there were a number of claims made, there were a number of promises made 
by these bio companies, by these patent holders, that have just simply not held up. So, while on the one hand, this is a simple matter of free speech, and I don't think it's any more complicated than that, it's also important to understand that there's a, there's a good reason that consumers ought to have the right to know. And, and, those, and, and the reason is, is that many of the promises that got this technology approved in the first place have not been borne out. For example, we were told that these would be much higher yielding crops that we would get dramatic increases in yields, and you've heard the whole feed the world argument of 9.6 billion people by the year uh, 2050 were gonna need a greater yield production. Well, the Union of Concerned Scientists and many other uh, reputable groups have long since blown that balloon out of the water. There have not yet been proven higher yields. They, Monsanto, uh, Dow, DuPont, Bayer, Syngenta, et cetera, will, will make the case that you're getting higher yields because you have better pest control or better drought resistance. But in fact, scientifically, uh, this has not yet proven to be the case. I'll go ahead to the next slide. Another uh, of the major claims, uh, uh, oh, and it, it's important to note too that in the very same period um, uh, that these crops have evolved, uh, again, uh, with the sort of uh, wind behind the sails that they were gonna produce higher yields, we have seen dramatic evidence on the organic side of uh, much, much better and higher yields than anybody uh, previously had documented, simply because as the organic industry has grown, you know, when Stonyfield uh, began in 1983, nobody knew what we were talking about. Um, you know, I often say back then we had a wonderful business, just no supply and no demand. Uh, today, you know, it's a $30 uh, billion dollar industry. And, and as a result, more and more research has happened. Side-by-side uh, -side studies at Rodale, 30 years of side-by-side -side studies looking at organic corn versus non-organic, and of course now that means GMO, have demonstrated the results that you see here. Uh, dramatically higher yields, particularly in drought conditions, because as you put more carbon into the soil, which is the whole point of organic growing, you have better water retention. Unless you think of, this is sort of, you know, Rodale's uh, you know, bias because they're somehow uh, you know, 30 years of research notwithstanding, they're somehow, uh, you know, uh, in a lunatic fringe. If you go to the next slide, yes, please, um, you'll see, uh, no, go no further than, you know, the heart of the Corn Belt, Iowa State University, where again, long-term uh, research has been going on since 1998, is showing either more or comparable yields from organic versus conventional, uh, but with dramatically lower inputs. And so, Again, uh, argument number one, we need GMOs because they're going to feed the world. It's yet to be proven. And I'm not here to say, nor should anyone say, it might not one day be proven, but it is yet to be proven, which ought to at least give us some pause. A second uh, contention that was made is uh, that, remember that the two primary genes that have been, traits that have been engineered into these crops are for uh, delivery of insecticide, primarily this uh, Bt, bacterial thuringiensis, or herbicide tolerance. And we were told with the corn, the Bt corn, which has been so successful, uh, su successfully adopted out there, that we would have much lower uh, uses of insecticide. That, as it turns out, has been true. We've, in, the, in the time period from 96 to 2011, we've used 132 million less pounds of insecticide, but that's because it's in the crop. We're not spraying as much because it's ever present. But the other contention that was made, I think if you go to the next slide, I've got something on this. Um, 123 million, not 132, excuse me. The other uh, contention, just one more click, uh, is that, of course, uh, uh, this toxin would uh, not pass through our digestive system. We wouldn't even get past our saliva into our bodies. And we've since seen uh, dramatic uh, results that I'll show you in the next slide. But one important point is that an additional claim is that, of course, this would be uh, give us more efficacious control, better control of rootworms. Um, and indeed, like with antibiotics, when you overuse a solution, you know, in nature, when it's under threat, the bugs and, 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 and uh, uh, organisms don't, you know, do focus groups to figure out what to do when they're under Assault, they just mutate and evolve, and we've now seen a whole generation of multiple species of these uh, rootworms that have now developed resistance because we're overusing this technology. Next slide, please. Um, uh, this is the, what I was starting to mention, is that there's now all kinds of data out there that shows that, in fact, the uh, Bt toxin 
uh, at much higher concentrations than we were exposed to before the introduction of these crops is now showing up actually in the cord blood of uh, pregnant women. So it's, it's out there, we've, eat, we're, we've ingested it, it's in our bodies, it did not get broken down by our saliva or our gastric juices or what have you. Um, next one, please. Um, the, the, the issue that really concerns me, I think, click one more time, you get the chart, is this one. Uh, and this is why I opened these remarks by saying this really is a toxins issue. The other major trait, as I explained, uh, has been for herbicide tolerance. Um, and again, the promise made back in 1996 in this testimony that you can actually uh, see to this effect is that dramatic, we would see dramatic reductions in herbicide use in this country. Uh, to the contrary, as you can see by this chart, we have not only uh, significantly more, almost a half, over a half a billion more pounds of herbicides that we've used as a result of these crops, but in fact the numbers, are, the, 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 the in annual increases are growing, going up and up and up. You can see what's happening in 2011 versus uh, what was happening in 96. In 96 we used something in the order of uh, 14 million pounds of glyphosate in this country. In 2012, we happen to now have the data, we need to update the chart, we use close to 200 million pounds. So this is, this is not just a, a cumulative increase, this is an annually increasing number. And any farmers here will uh, agree with me, I think, that you have to really understand what's going on here. Historically, we would use glyphosate, Roundup, as many of us know it, um, prophylactically at the very beginning of the season for a week or two. You would put the seeds in the ground and then do a, a spray because you want to give you those seedlings a fighting chance against weeds that were there. Now, because of herbicide tolerant crop technology, you can you can spray it well whenever you want. In fact, we have all kinds of evidence that farmers are spraying in the final two weeks of the harvest at a time of year when it's never been sprayed before, simply because they can give their crops a final kick, a little added advantage to get to, um, a crop. Um, uh, to, to improve the, uh, the, 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 uh, the actual uh, commodity or crop uh, growing. Next one, please. Um, you can see this herbicide increase has happened across the board now. Uh, and, 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 and the issue is, again, not just the amount, but it's the amount of time that we're spraying. We're now spraying throughout the growing season. Uh, so much so that, if you click again, please, um, the U U.S. Geological Survey has now shown us that in 60 to 100 percent of rainwater and air samples, we are now uh, seeing uh, the presence of glyphosate. This has never been seen before. So what this means, to put it more bluntly, is we're breathing it and we're eating it. And of course, anybody downwind from uh, the, the Corn Belt, i.e., all of us uh, here, are of course uh, in the same boat. And so what you've got here is a situation where, again, you've got very profitable patented seeds which have leveraged uh, an, an, literally an explosion in the use of very, very profitable uh, chemical compounds. Now, I know that you're now thinking this is the most depressing guy I've ever listened to in my life. <laughs> and I would love to tell you this is the end of the story, but unfortunately it gets a little bit worse. Um, let's go to the next one. Uh, many of you are undoubtedly aware that just as with the corn rootworms, we're now getting a whole new generation of weeds that are resistant because we're overusing. Weeds that used to be well controlled by small prophylactic doses of glyphosate. Um, I testified at a meeting um, some time ago in Arkansas and a farmer there uh, got up and talked to a soy farmer, uh, no, corn farmer, uh, got up and talked about a pigweed in his uh, fields that is 12 feet tall, the diameter of his wrist, and he said it will stop my combine in its tracks. Uh, he said, the only way I can actually control these weeds is with uh, machetes or chainsaws, uh, which is more labor cost, which of course, you know, no farmer needs. Uh, so in the infinite wisdom, um, the chemical companies have come up with a solution to help farmers like this. They've come up with a new uh, uh, cocktail where you mix with your glyphosate a 10% solution of 2,4-D, or dicamba. Um, anybody with gray hair in this audience knows the last time you heard about 2,4-D. It's 50% of Agent Orange. There's a long-lasting, multi-generational legacy of the overuse of 2,4-D. Uh, the Dow folks will tell you, well, that was really the dioxin that caused all the birth defects. 
the way back to my FDA um, dis uh, discussion with you. And this is exactly why we believe uh, that it, it is necessary for the FDA to broaden its, its de definition of material from the 1992 voluntary guideline. Uh, we believe, and again, 1.3 million people have joined us, and I hope you all have signed uh, the petition. Go to justlabelit.org. We continue to add names. Uh, let's go to the next one. Um, it goes without saying that the problems are much greater and worse than we probably understand. Uh, you've seen studies of late that show uh, dramatic decreases in biodiversity, probably tied to the overuse of these defoliants, these herbicides. Uh, you know, the fact that they're designed to uh, restrict weed uh, growth or crop growth doesn't mean, it, you know, ignores the fact that it is in the food chain. And so whether it's monarchs or other natural predators, uh, we're seeing problems. Studies have now been released uh, this summer showing greater, more compact soils because essentially soil microorganisms are failing and therefore uh, all of the, the nutrient pathways, all of the, the tilth that results from having uh, healthy living ecosystems in the soil is also being uh, um, uh, challenged. So again, um, there are uh, a plethora of issues here, but this is why I talk about this as a toxins problem and not just as a... a, a as a matter of fact, to be even more blunt, you will not find anything in the literature from Just Label It that says GMOs, uh, we contend that GMOs are unsafe. Uh, because one cannot actually say that responsibly, and we need to understand that when we're going political, we have to be evidence-based, we've got to be, uh, we've got to be able to stand on our facts. And the truth is, while the National Academy of Sciences does suggest that the proliferation of GMOs could result in greater allergens, and could result in greater toxins. The reality is we have not done the epidemiologic research, we have not done the long-term research, we have not done the independent research. All of the research on safety has been done by or funded by the patent holders. Our federal government's policy is, it's up to the patent holders to, um, uh, we're relying on their, their um, um, contentions of safety. It does happen that most of the safety uh, research has been done with, on rats uh, with 90-day studies, You've seen the one study in France that went the life cycle of the rats, two years, where you had very, very different and very tragic, uh, the, uh, very, very uh, unnerving results. You've seen the same thing with pigs, but we still, again, while there's, there's, there's speculation, there's reason to believe that independent safety analysis needs to be done, that is not the reason uh, that we can base our labeling argument. The reason to base our label argument is very simple. We have the right to know our federal government should provide us with those protections. There are material things happening out there, and the only way that consumers can actually vote, the only way the marketplace can work, is if we know what we're buying. Let's go to the next one. And this really leads me to the uh, political uh, <coughs> aspect of this, and I'll wind up my remarks here. Um, we contracted with the Melman Group uh, in, uh, to do a national polling uh, last year that showed that 92% of Americans want the right to choose. There was no statistical difference between Republicans, Democrats, and independents. Uh, Melman, when he released these results at the press conference, said uh, in his uh, 40 years of polling, he has never seen 92% of Americans agree on anything. Uh, <laughs> we just conducted released polling data in New Hampshire uh, last week that showed the exact same thing. 93% of New Hampshire voters, and again, you, can, you all know how device of our little state is across the river. Um, this was, a, again, an extraordinary result. Let's go to the next one. I'm sorry, it's 91, not 92. And this is why, of course, these GE labeling efforts are happening state by state by state. And so I want to just wrap up by bringing this right back to you and what you're doing here today and what you're going to be doing this year as this now gets debated at your Senate. Um, Maine and Connecticut have passed contingent on uh, four or five other states. In, in, in Connecticut, it's, uh, it's pretty thinly disguised. They're essentially making a contingent on New York State passing it. They use all kinds of adjectives to describe a large state near us with more than X number of people. But, <laughs> and, and, you know, it's not Rhode Island. Uh, and so, uh, and Maine uh, uh, made a contingent on four other states in the Northeast one of which has to be contiguous. Well, there's only one state contiguous with Maine, and it isn't New Brunswick. Um, 
And again, that's why the fight in New Hampshire is now going to the floor of the New Hampshire House in January. As you saw this week, it did not pass in, a subcommittee recommended it for passage. It went down 12 to 8 yesterday. Um, but we do believe that uh, there's reason to believe that we can get a win on the floor. Uh, but the important point, as I mentioned to you, is that these states, state efforts, essentially usher in the inevitable. Because if you strip away everything I just said to you today, and I know many of you would like to forget all the depressing stuff I said, understand this. Um, this is a fight for our civil liberties. This is about whether our country is of, for, and by us, the citizens, or of, for, or by six chemical companies. There's only one reason not to label, uh, not to label, and that's that if you believe that their rights trump our rights, these six chemical companies trump our rights as citizens. Now, you'll see all kinds of smoke screens go up, you'll see all kinds of noise, it's proven to be safe, it's the most tested it's ever been, there's nothing wrong. This is not about safety. I assure you, if we were sure that these crops were not safe, we would not be arguing for labeling. We'd be arguing to get them out of our food. So don't get yourselves caught in that, in that um, uh, argument. This is not about safety. This is about our right to know, and there's plenty of precedent. Again, you know, wild versus farm, the radiation. Again, orange juice from concentrate. I mean, I don't know whether that's been controversial anywhere, but it's mandatorily labeled that you have to know. Now, I, prom I defy you to taste the difference between orange juice from concentrate and none. Some of you may say, well, I can taste the difference. Well, that's great. The point is you at least get to choose. You get to know. And again, we're talking about a couple of little words. This is a very simple matter of exactly what a small group of folks, you know, a la Margaret Mead, uh, talked about back in the late seventh, late 18th century, which is, you know, we ought to have the right to religious freedom. That little startup called the United States of America got it started on this very simple premise that we're asking for here. Uh, if you could go to the next one, please. So, um, as we look politically to what's about to happen here, um, again, I cannot stress enough to you how critical it is to win some more states. Uh, we do, by the way, have labeling in three states. We have labeling of GE salmon that's been approved in Alaska. Um, so these other state efforts, though, though we need a federal solution, and most parties agree, and uh, even our grocery association in New Hampshire this week said we need, a federal, we need mandatory federal labeling. Uh, and as we start to see some of these companies uh, uh, get nervous about positioning themselves as being against knowing what they're feeding you, um, you're going to see uh, increasing effort at the, at the federal level. But the state efforts are what's going to drive us there. And it's important to understand that in, in one state, in this case the home of Monsanto, um, in Missouri, this was uh, a, an act that was uh, 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 put, put in place. And you've heard about the Monsanto uh, Protection Act. It ultimately did not pass. But we are now turning our attention federally to the Farm Bill, where we're very focused on being sure that a rider like this does not, which essentially preempts state actions, uh, does not uh, make its way through uh, with the Farm Bill. And we know getting a Farm Bill out right now is critical to the nation's farmers. Uh, and the urgency is giving uh, folks on the no side some um, in, in increased uh, confidence that maybe they can slip something like this in. So you've got to be vigilant. I, frankly, you know, with your senators, this is not a concern, and, and with uh, Peter Welch. Uh, but for those of you from other states or with family in other states, this is really a crucial thing to be sure that federal legislators do not let this happen. But it's also important, if you could go to the next one, please, to um, understand what I said before. And I'll wrap up with this. Um, these are the companies I was referring, this is a, a, the graph that I was referring to on our website. Um, many, many, many of these large companies are now starting to get the jitters because they're seeing that each time a, a Prop 37 happens, the reason I call Prop 37 and 522 wins, even though we didn't technically win, is that this elevates the discussion. It puts it out there. And what that means is if you're a, um, uh, a Nestle uh, uh, or a Coke, uh, you know, what you're really doing when you're funding these efforts in those states is you're saying, in 2013, we don't want you to know what we're feeding you. And, and we're going to spend money. And now, now that is not exactly a, a, you know, a marketing campaign built for success, as far as I'm concerned. 
Uh, and, 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 and I think increasingly these companies are seeing it. And so it is interesting to note the companies in yellow. Uh, it's interesting to note uh, Unilever, for example, a parent company of Ben & Jerry's, did not re-up. And I will assure you that these companies are reaching out to us for discussions. The critical part here is that uh, it cannot be about voluntary labeling, which we know they would love. That voluntary does not do it. Voluntary is, an, is, a, is, a, is, is too big a, a, a leaves too big a, 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 an opening for uh, all kinds of corruption. We must have mandatory labeling. Nothing less than mandatory labeling is what we're seeking. But I assure you that the state efforts are not being lost on these companies, and that's really my point. You know, you've got uh, however many citizens there are in the Northeast states that will pass this are consumers. And, and that's as important as anything that we're doing politically. Let's go one more, please. I think that was... Um, leads me to my end. Um, there, there are um, uh, all kinds of uh, reasons to be vigilant here. Uh, these are one of the most and best funded lobbies that we've ever seen. Uh, you could liken it to coal and oil and the fossil fuel lobby, those of us in the climate, working on climate stuff, those of us in Maddox, working on climate. Um, <laughs> This is uh, the work of our lives. This is not, uh, we pass it in Vermont, it's, it's, it's another notch in the belt. Ultimately, the answer is going to be at the federal level. But like the creation of this company, this country, this, well, that's probably, yeah. uh, that's probably <laughs> not the right slip. But like the creation of this country, it began at the local level. It began right here in the Northeast and in, in the East with the 13 colonies. And that's really what the effort uh, in Montpelier is about. We need to get a few more states, whether we're working on um, the feds, whether we're working on uh, the companies. Uh, the primary argument you're going to hear uh, is the one you've already heard, which is if we pass it, we're going to get sued. Um, that's why the contingent um, passing with other states is not actually a bad idea. Because again, there's some safety in numbers. And the other one you're going to hear is it's going to elevate the costs of uh, our food. There's exactly zero evidence that labeling will do this. There was none, no evidence uh, in Europe or in the other 64 nations uh, where this has passed. And even more to the point, understand uh, the, the claim of um, increased cost goes to two points. One, label changes. Well, you know, every time a Disney movie comes out, most of these companies change their labels. Okay, I can tell you as one manufacturer, we change our label once annually. There's always new data coming out. There's no, and, and there's never at a cost to us. And the other is uh, this so-called um, cost of segregated supply. That farmers, uh, that, that processors uh, would have to have a supply from Vermont or supply from Maine versus supply from other states. That's, of course, completely ludicrous. Anybody who is uh, in business in this world knows that if enough consumers speak, um, we are going to, uh, as companies, adjust to the realities and meet consumers' needs. And if consumers say, we want it labeled, and then, and then the, the products that are being labeled um, uh, sell less, then believe me, companies are going to do just what Monsanto did in, uh, in, in Europe, and you saw that earlier. So I conclude with this, and 30 years in business has taught me one thing. These companies uh, live, uh, these companies work for us. I know you don't feel it, and you watch their kind of like, expressions of their political power, and their lobbying, but the reality is every time you run an item past a scanner, you're voting. And, those, and corporate America and the food business spend billions of dollars to tally those votes. And that's why I always like to remind us that of Gandhi's expression uh, before we go to the Q&A here, and that is that he said, anybody who thinks they're too small to make a difference has never been in bed with a mosquito. Uh, <laughs> that's what this is about. We've just got to be mosquitoes at the State House, but also in our, uh, in our daily purchases. Thanks so much for listening.
piece of news that the EPA supposedly raised the allowable level of, I would say, about 3,000%. That was a number that I just, I don't, I didn't have prepared for uh, more details. Maybe if, if you know something about that, you can talk to us about that. Yeah, there's, uh, I don't know that particular reference. I, I do know that, uh, that there's uh, petitions from uh, the patent holders to, uh, based on their own research, to increase the safety thresholds because we're now dealing, as you saw in my, one of my slides, we're dealing with levels of glyphosate that have never been, before been seen. Um, you know, you probably noticed this week that the FDA is now going to move to ban trans fats. You know, let's, let's, let's take a fresh look at that. They, they, they fought against labeling trans fats. They finally acceded to labeling it, and now uh, we're being told that they've got to be banned. So, you know, science evolves, uh, we get more data. We, of course, unfortunately, tend to get this data epidemiologically through actual experience, which is, you know, the most expensive way to fight cancer is to get it, right? You know, the, the, the most expensive form of health care is, 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 is to get sick. The cheapest form is to stay healthy. A little bit of, um, you know, a, a, a little bit of precautionary principle could go a long way here, but that is exactly what's going on, is that uh, we're using more and more thresholds. We haven't done the epidemiologic research. We haven't seen uh, long-term data. So in the absence of long-term data linking uh, glyphosate to health, uh, they're petitioning and I think getting approval for higher threshold. But what, 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 what's really important, and of course the <coughs> toxic action folks can talk about this all day long, to understand is we have no idea in this country what are the safe levels with any of these toxins in terms of cumulative effects. We, we don't measure that way. And we have no idea about synergistic effects. There's some hundred thousand combinations that we face every single day, just from fire retardants and you know air fresheners and stuff under our sinks and stuff in our food. Um, so uh, we really have uh, a long way to go as a species to evolve, to, to start to think more system systemically about this. So again, this is why it's material and why we want this stuff, uh, we want to have that choice on our labels. Um, so you talked about uh, rulemaking process and talking with FDA and trying to get them to move forward on that. Um, and I know Obama is a big component of that because of what's going on in Congress. Um, but I was just wondering, when you're talking with the FDA, how do you change your message to get them to initiate rulemaking? Is it different than dealing with any other um, entity that you're lobbying? And then in the same sense, how do you overcome regulatory capture to sort of move these agencies to really engage in the process? Yeah, we, uh, we believed the premise of just label it which we still subscribe to today, is that if enough citizens speak, uh, that, 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 that will reach the FDA in two ways. One, they have a statutory obligation to respond. Uh, interestingly, they did respond, they claim they have responded to our petition by saying we've received these signatures. That's the response. Uh, we think that the, uh, FF, the Federal Food Drug Cosmetic Act called for a little bit more concrete response to that. But the second is that, of course, you reach your, the 1.3 million people, hopefully, are reaching our senators and Congress people, uh, you know, on our oversight committees. Um, again, I want to be very explicit here. We don't believe that we need legislation to force them. Uh, but on the, on the other hand, uh, there's a boxer bill, uh, and there's a, um, uh, which your senators have signed on to. Uh, and there is a DeFazio amendment, which uh, Congressman Welch has signed on to. Uh, so, you know, these will be helpful, of course, and, and I do have to say that I think that, unfortunately, because we've seen that the, you know, 1.3 million signatures has not done it yet, I do think in the end, uh, we are probably going to have to go the legislative route. Uh, what troubles me about that is that's years. Uh, that, that's, you know, the Organic Food Production Act took, took, took it, took, you know, eight, ten years to become law, and then it, or eight, ten years to get legislation, and then 12 years to go into effect. And when you look at the kind of rising levels of, of these uh, herbicides, I don't think we have years. So we're going to continue to keep the pressure. That's why we believe we need to get our numbers to two million. But I also would suggest to you, as you undoubtedly picked up in my comments, that getting a few of these GMA companies to peel off uh, is going to be important. And so, you know, you see Ben and Jerry's very active in this stuff. 
you've got to reach the, the parent of Ben & Jerry's also. Uh, you have to reach some of these larger companies, particularly those who clearly had a stutter step here, and, and get them at the table also, because uh, again, I, I do believe the FDA uh, is going to be more responsive if we get some industry, if they can see that they're not just going, it's just not, you know, uh, anti-industry. Okay, we have time for one more question. question is, how close to doing the, the research are we? So if we're successful in getting it late, do we, will we be able to move pretty quickly into uh, independent research so that if there is an issue out there, we have you know, the grounds for making comment about that? Yeah, it's a great question. There's no linkage between getting labeling. We, we, we just label it has a platform that includes demanding more independent research, and we've, we're in the halls of USDA, which is different from FDA, of course, uh, oh, uh, and, and, and EPA arguing that, but there's, there's no direct link. Um, and, and, and we believe citizens should be calling for that as well. Um, the truth is, is that it's starting to happen in the marketplace anyways. The farmers, like the guy I mentioned in Arkansas, are demanding alternatives. The Weed, the weed Science Society meetings this summer uh, the, the, the land grant weed, you know, the conventional uh, uh, weed scientists are screaming for alternatives, not to put all of our eggs in this basket. They see what's going on. We, you know, build resistance, and then we uh, use more chemicals, and then we build resistance to them. It, it, it's, it, it just keeps going on and on. So you're starting to get more and more uh, concerns, and now you're starting to get public health concerns about, you know, the USGS study really raised eyebrows. There were literally rain sample studies for some periods that showed 100% of samples uh, containing glyphosate. So, um, you know, this is unfortunately one of these things that needs some momentum, uh, but, but you can't link, you can't necessarily link the two. Okay, thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your conference.